Well, welcome everyone. As you all know, we've been having a series of these keynotes uh, in a collaboration between the Foresight Foundation and the Carbon Copies Foundation recently in our neurotech group. And uh, I hope that this is going to be another stimulating conversation. I'm sure it will be. Um, uh, today we have here Professor Dong Strong, who is a research assistant professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Southern California. And um, at the Carbon Copy Foundation, we've had the pleasure of having Professor Dong Song involved with a number of our workshops before. Um, it's always been incredibly enlightening about the reality of what it takes uh, to to attempt to make uh, neuroprosthetic um, applications, medical neuroprosthetic applications for human patients. Um, Dong Song has been involved with uh, detailed neurolinear, uh, sorry, nonlinear dynamic modeling of brain regions, and in particular those regions uh, in or functionally adjacent to the hippocampus. And with uh, neuromedical and neuroprosthetic engineering interventions uh, with experimental verification with human volunteer patients, which is quite unique. That is something that we see very little of, except maybe in the field of uh, epilepsy, where there's some work going on there as well with devices. Um, so as we get going, let me just briefly explain uh, where we're at, Dong Song, because you haven't been um, you haven't been part of one of these meetings yet. I don't know if you know the uh, the Foresight Site Foundation at all. But uh, Foresight has been around for quite a long time. They uh, started out with a focus very much on uh, nanomachines and, and that area of work, but then expanded into supporting work that is in all manner of forward-seeking uh, technological fields that help to create a, a better future for humanity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had the great pleasure late last year of uh, starting a partnership with them and uh, to help create this, uh, this neuro group, this neurotech group, where we have conversations with interesting persons from all over the field of, uh, of uh, neuroengineering and neurotechnology and neuroscience. Um, I will let you uh, introduce the topic. Uh, oh. I think you have some slides, right? So maybe you want yeah. to give us a little bit of a presentation there, and then after that, we'll have conversation with Q&A. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think I prepared way too many slides, uh, but just in case. <laughs> yeah. Sure, uh, just, just pick the one. I would try to show. briefly yeah. go through that. Uh, uh, how long should I spend on this? Like uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes? You, you can spend 15, 20 minutes on it, and then we can have a conversation. Yeah. Okay, okay, sounds good. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so today I talked about our effort on uh, developing a hippocampal memory prosthesis. Uh, it's still in very early stage, but I will talk about uh, the modeling and the interface technology uh, we have developed uh, to support the prosthesis. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm the director of USC New Modeling and the Interface Lab. Our main research goal, we have two goals actually. One is understanding the brain, uh, answering all the basic neuroscience uh, questions such as how the memory functions form in the hippocampus. And second is more like an engineering goal. We also try to build cortical processes that can restore cognitive functions, not in diseases or injuries. And our approach is to develop next generation modeling and the new interface technology, right, to invest brain function during naturalistic behavior. So there are really three ingredients in our approach. One is modeling, the other is the uh, interface technology, and finally is the behavioral test, uh, both in human and, uh, and animal models. So here's the concept of hippocampal memory prosthesis. It's really about mimetic device, try to mimic the signal processing function of hippocampal circuits. And uh, in order to do that, we need to interpret the hippocampus, right? To record and also stimulate the hippocampus and also using a computational model to based on the input signal to predict what the output signal is. And hopefully that input output transformation is sufficient for capturing the functional property of the hippocampal circuit. And by doing that, we recover from upstream 
predict what the desirable a desired output signal to the downstream reading is, and then use the micro simulator to write in that memory code back to the hippocampus. And by doing that, we sort of try to reinstate the uh, signal processing, right? And also, hopefully, that can restore the uh, hippocampal function, the memory function, not in diseases. So that's our approach. So this is very different from the deep learning, uh, you know, like BDS, that approach. So, you know, we are both using in terms of device. We are both using electrical stimulation to cultural regions. But what's fundamentally different is that uh, DBS is really new modulation, right? But the prosthesis is a, is a, we try to do the function uh, restoration, right? It's not based on unclear un mechanism, but based on fundamental principles of neuroscience, such as neural encoding and re encoding. And also, in order to deliver that kind of stimulation, we need to uh, basically, you know, instead of the DBS, right, we do, uh, people do, single channel synchronized high intensity stimulation. Here we really try to write in the neural code by sending multi-channel, right, neural code based asynchronized low intensity stimulation, right? So the electrical pulses we write into the brain should mean something, right? It should carry the uh, information about memory, right? And it's also different from the sensory processes or motor processes because we exclusively working with the internal signals of the brain. The hippocampus is a deep brain structure. It doesn't directly connect to the in, uh, video input, right, sensory input or motor output. So our model has to be uh, you know, dealing with the brain signal as input and also brain signal as output. And the, the modeling goal would be capturing this kind of input output transformation. Uh, in those spatial temporal patterns of, of brain signals, okay? So now I've been using this model for many, many years. This model we developed over 15 years ago. So it's a hybrid magnetic and input op model. And the goal here is try to, based on the recorded input output by trend, to capture the transformation so we can predict the output based on the ongoing input by trend. Uh, in a near real time fashion. And the model structure was inspired by the signal trans transmission property of single neuron. And with a lot of mathematical manipulation, so the whole model can be identifiable. Right? And we tested this model uh, in rodents many years ago, where we trained the animal to perform memory dependent, delayed non metal sample task, right? In which the animal needs to remember certain locations then after delay based on that memory to get the correct response and get a water re reward. So in short, what we did that, first we take the normal animal, record normal input output signal, and get the normal forgetting curve as you can see here, right? And then we disrupt uh, the connectivity between two hippocampal regions, C3 to C1, C3 being the input, C1 being the output. And when we do that, the signal transmission was disrupted and the memory performance decreased. And finally, what we did that with this blockade of the transmission, we record from the input region, C3 region, and they use the model we identified from C3, C1 signal from the normal recording to predict what the C1 signal should be. And then we use a micro stimulator to stimulate that pattern back to the C1 region. And by doing that, we partially right, restore, reinstate the signal transmission, and also we partially uh, re recover the memory function in those rodents. We also tested this uh, approach in human subjects. In human, we recruited epileptic patients uh, from different hospitals, and uh, we, turned the, uh, uh, not, not, we asked the pa uh, human patients to perform a delayed medical sample task in which the patient need to remember certain image. So it's a visual memory task. Then after delay, based on his memory, to recall what the correct image she saw among all the distractors, as you can see on the top left figure. Right. And then when the patient is performing this task, we record the C3 and C1 activities uh, 
you know, using a multilateral array as shown uh, on right, right? We, now the new surgeon positioned the electrical in such a way that uh, some of the electrodes can record from input region and some electrodes can record from output region. So using very similar principle, we build the model. And you can see here on left, right? That's a comparison between the model pre prediction and the actual output signal we recorded from C1. So using the model, we can very accurately predict all output signal based on the input signal, right? And use that output signal to uh, stimulate the hippocampal region, right? Uh, output region. And superimpose on the normal activity to enhance the memory formation in those patients. And what we see is uh, it's shown in the uh, right bottom figure uh, in two different paths. One is the immediate short memory path. The other one is the longer delay. Uh, it's called delay recognition task. We show that when we do this kind of pattern, memory dependent, right, uh, stimulation to the hippocampus, we can enhance the memory function compared to no stimulation or random stimulation. Okay. So uh, to support this kind of processes, we built multiple uh, multiple input out models, including the multi input multi out model I just described. And also recently, uh, we also start to build the what we call memory decoding model. Right. So the MIMO model's purpose is try to predict output based on input, without explicitly understanding what's embedded in those code. But the memory decoding model, we, we try to right, decode the spatial temporal pattern spikes and find out what kind of memory the patient is trying to remember. Okay. So we try to match those patterns with the, uh, with the different image categories. Okay. So a uh, recent year, uh, with the advance of deep learning, uh, we also make a new generation of MIMO model uh, using deep learning techniques, for example, like a convolutional neural network, right? One of my students, Brian Moore, is working on this project. And the advantage of using a deep structure is that, you know, all previous model, MIMO model, is, re is a relatively shallow model. It's only two layer, right? So it's appropriate and sufficient for capturing C3 to C1 transformation, which is only one synapse away in the hippocampus, but might not be sufficient for modeling more complex, more nonlinear transformation. So in order to solve that problem, uh, we combine convolutional neural network with the MIMO model. So we can capture arbitrary high order nonlinearity uh, underlying the signal transmission in the brain. Okay. And for memory decoding, I have another student, he or she, uh, he developed this model. It's a double layer uh, ensemble uh, classifier. I won't go to the details. But the key idea here is that because in real uh, human experiments, we have very small uh, sample size, right? In order to get to, you know, we will only get a few hours from each patient. So when we can, there's a limited number of images we can show to the patients. So in this type of model, we try to build a very, very shallow model with a, a minimum number of layers. And the, uh, also leverage uh, different ensemble learning technology to reduce model estimation variance and to get to, to avoid overfitting and get as accurate prediction as possible. So, yeah, so we, we take data from the same delay metro sample task, right? We take different data, like uh, the spatial temporal patterns around the sample phase or spatial temporal pattern around max phase. And also we design two negative control case. Uh, to make sure we are not overfitting the data. In one case, we randomize the label. So we disrupt the uh, correlation between neural signal and the image. And in the other one, we shift the window. So the data was taken from the brain before the image were presented. So there shouldn't be any correlation at all, right? If the model is overfitting, they won't tell the difference between there. So we will need to get higher performance in the first two cases, but low performance in the second two cases. Okay. And the, the key idea here is that we try to identify sparse, right, uh, region, spatial temporal regions in the whole pattern. So we reduce the very high dimensional input space into a lower dimensional space. 
and then you you assemble learning right to try different partition of the data uh, with different reputation to re reduce the model variance. And what's shown here is that on top, that's a real human study, right? Human recordings from different uh, categories of images. As you can see visually, it's really hard to tell the difference between those activities. But with this technology, one key component technology is in the third row, it's called SBUS, classification functional matrix. Those matrices, they act acting as a characteristic mask, right, for, uh, for identifying the region of interest in those patterns, right? So if you don't apply this mask, looking at those patterns, you get the blue bars. You don't see any difference across different categories. But if, if you apply this mask onto those patterns and calculate the number of spikes within those different regions, you will see the bottom red bar you can see, right? It uh, reveals the difference between the different patterns across the different categories. So that enables us to decode different memory functions, uh, different memory contents from the spiking activities. And the, here's our result. We show like uh, uh, the result of presenting metric correcting coefficient, one being perfect prediction, zero being no prediction. And then we can see uh, on left, right, using the sample response signal, we can decode to a pretty high level, right, like uh, almost like 50% in some category and around 30% in other categories. So remember, this, this is only 100 to 200 trials, right, but the prediction is still significant. And also we get comparable uh, response, right, a re a classification in using data from the match response activities. Right. And as the next we can show, if we shuffle the label or shift the time window, we don't get any significant decoding. And also using the two layer structure, right? I didn't mention that the two layer structure is try to combine different temporal resolution uh, from the uh, decoding. Because we don't know what the time, uh, optimal temporal resolution is in terms of decoding, right? So we need to include a lot of different temporal resolution and then fuse them in the second layer to maximize the uh, model performance, okay? So that, that's kind of input of modeling approach we, are, we have been working on. And also that the new project in my group is try to combine input output and the magnetic model, right, together to study the hippocampus. So when I talk about input of model, what I really mean is the machine learning type of model, what people are using, right? But on the other hand, there's also biological realism right, the hippocampus, the hippocampus. It's not an arbitrary intelligence machine, right? We also need to respect the biology. So uh, I identify this approach by combining those two different uh, methods, right? Using machine learning type of model, almost like a discriminative model or a discriminative model to tell the difference between the real hippocampus and the, the simulated hippocampus. And then at the same time, we do the magnetic, highly realistic hippocampal model as a generative model. And the whole idea is look at the giant framework, right? We use the discriminative model to validate the simulated hippocampus compared with the real hippocampus and doing that iteratively until we can build a highly realistic and also accurate hippocampal model. Okay. So I think this effort is really complementary to the input on output model we have been using for supporting the processes. So lastly, I want to very briefly talk about the, our effort on the interface technology, uh, because you now, as, as you know, right, those electrodes we use in human is highly limited. They were actually developed for DBS. We only have the around 10, 20 channels, and that's, that's obviously not sufficient for building a real clinically viable processes. And also they are all temporary. We only implant those electrodes for two weeks. After two weeks, we expand those electrodes. And that's obviously not good enough for the chronic application. So in order to support that, now ideally what we really want is high density, right? Chronic recording and stimulation from multiple brain regions, right? And they, from a lot of neurons, that's basically what we need. In order to do that, I collaborated with uh, Dr. Alex Moon from USC uh, to develop this paradigm-based conformal hippocampal array. So the electrodes have a certain 3D layout, 
that can maximize the chunk of recording the region of interest in different uh, brain regions. And also since the electrode is soft, right, it can uh, avoid a lot of immune response and uh, have a much better you know, uh, recording quality and also uh, chronic recording. So yeah, this figure show a very standard uh, 2D navigation uh, you know, data we recorded from rapid campus, a very standard trade field, and we can take, uh, record very high quality local field potential and action potentials. And uh, at bottom left figure, you can see we can record up to one year, right, which is uh, very good compared to the standard rigid electrode, uh, which can only record around one or two months. Okay. And I think this is really critical, not only for studying the chronic, right, long-term synap synaptic behavior in the animal, but it, this is absolutely essential for building the real processes. Okay. And also, uh, you know, in our approach, generating the, when we generate the neural code, sending those codes back to the brain is not trivial, right? You cannot have a, a large number of uh, independent stimulators. Yeah, that will consume a lot of power and a lot of the computation. And here we also developed this uh, uh, multiplexer based, uh, neural code based uh, micro stimulator, right? And also with artifact suppression, because what we really want to have is uh, not only the behavioral outcome, but also the e phase feedback, right? e phase signal uh, for us to monitor the stimulation to make sure you know, we are stimulating the right region, generating the right response, okay? So artifact, artifact uh, rejection and also neural code asynchronous stimulator, they are both important for this type of application, okay? And also uh, we have uh, other students working on using the same microelectrodes to do the recording and stimulation simultaneously, right? And that requires the improvement of the surface a property of the microelectrode. For example, one solution is using platinum iridium coating. So we increase the charge capacity so we can deliver relatively larger current to that tiny tip of the microelectrode. And that enables the simultaneous recording and the stimulation from thin micro channels. And finally, as the side product, right, uh, because we are doing this, right, this is really important for us. We also uh, got this NIH grant, right, to start this so-called Pi Foundry. Uh, it's an NIH U24 grant uh, led by Dr. Ming and myself, right? The goal is to develop, customize, optimize different uh, electrodes, right, for different brain regions, for different species to support basic neuroscience research. And my ultimate goal of doing this is eventually we, you know, uh, improve, right, and enhance and expand those technology into humans. So, uh, so we can have a chronic, very large scale recording electrodes for human recording, for human clinical trials. And we all test all those technology in different uh, behavioral tasks, such as free navigation, uh, virtual reality, and the, what I just mentioned, delay non-micro sample task. Okay. So yeah, uh, I already spent more than 20 minutes. I hope it's not too long. But basically, we are trying to uh, combine three things. One is the uh, machine learning, right, and the biological based model modeling, because you know, brain is the intelligence device, right. So you know, it shouldn't be too surprising that in order to replace the brain function, you need to have some computational unit, right. And then second is the interpret technology, because we want to record from a lot of neurons and also manipulate independent a lot of neurons. And by doing that, we, we can uh, no, uh, decode the brain signal and write in the brain signal. And finally, this whole paradigm need to be tested in richer multiple behavioral tasks, right? Because that's what people need. We don't need a prosthetic device that can only work for delay number sample tasks, right? In, in the hospital. We, we, what we really need is this device and the computational model can work for all kinds of behavior. Okay. So I will stop here. Yeah, fantastic. This was a really great, fast uh, catch up. And I'm sure that we already have uh, a dozen different questions lined up. Um, uh, but before I open it up to the floor, 
I wanted to make sure that I could get maybe five questions in before everybody else dives in just because I'm so curious, um, but also to make a few things clear. Um, I think uh, that maybe some people who aren't as familiar with the work that you've been doing, what they might be wondering about is because if they've heard about uh, neural prosthetics or they've heard about neural interfacing before, then they're used to systems where um, the, the, let's say the patient, if we're talking about a human or a primate or whatever, uh, where the one who's receiving that, that, uh, that interface is doing a lot of the work learning to use the interface. Um, so maybe it's important to point out how this is different when you're working with human patients, for example, in, uh, in a clinical, clinical trial, they don't really get to train to use the interface, uh, very much, do they? They have a very limited time window in which everything happens. And that also kind of constrains right. Right. the length of all the, what you can acquire and, and that bites a hundred to 200 trials, right? Yeah. The, the time frame is, uh, is usually it's within two weeks, right? Uh, so day one, the patient got implanted with this electrode, right? And they, they were implanted with this electrode actually for a different purpose. Uh, the new surgeon, they try to find the origin of the seizure, right? So they can later decide what kind of intervention they will use. And typically, it's a surgical intervention. Uh, for example, remove part of the hippocampus or cortex to stop seizure, right? So while they are waiting, right? Uh, in the hospital for next seizure to happen with those implanted electrodes. So we got that consent to perform those uh, memory dependent tasks. So we didn't implant those electrodes for running our experiment. We are really right, taking the, this opportunity right, to, to test the procedure. And the, in the hospital, there's a lot of limitation. It's not like a, you, know, you work with a, you know, lab animals, right? You can design whatever you, you want to do. And here, basically, we have uh, two days we can work with patients. Uh, on each day, we have about three, four hours to do everything, right? including setting up and finish the experiment. So for each experiment, it typically lasts for around one to two hours. So uh, that's the reason we can only have a limited number of the images presented to the, to the patient. Yeah, and these are, and this these is, very common. is it bilateral yeah. usually? Bilateral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so the patient will look. I didn't show that image here, right? Because I know this is recorded, and uh, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, show those real patient image. But basically, they, they are looking at this touch screen, right? Touch screen. On touch screen, we will show them those images, and uh, we we need to tell them how to perform the task, right? But you know, humans, you know, they can easily learn this within like uh, you know, ten seconds, right? It just take mm -hmm. the doctor explain how to do that, right? So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, the biggest difference between human study and animal study is that animal, you cannot directly interact with them, right? You need to train them to finally figure out what the task means. A patient, you can just ask them, right? They, they yep. get it right away. So. Yeah, yeah. And I know this is kind of off topic, but um, a lot of people wonder whether a patient can really tell and can notice when there is a neuroprosthetic that is active in their brain or not. And I know that you have asked the patients how they feel when they're going through this experiment. What was the result that they told you? Yeah, they didn't feel anything. So we didn't do a very you know, rigorous uh, double blind test, right? But every time we ask them whether they feel anything in their brain, uh, or, or they, you know, I shouldn't say feel anything in the brain because, you know, brain is not a sensory organ, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But, but to, we ask them whether they feel like they recall something new, you know, trigger some of the old memory, right? Which happened in a lot of other experiments. Uh, for example, like, uh, you know, Lozano's uh, uh, pretty famous, right? Uh, studies like, uh, when they do the deep brain stimulation to certain brain regions for a different purpose, with very strong stimulation, some patients really recall, you know, they, they report a recall of a very strong memory happened many years ago, right? But we never uh, had patients, you know, reporting anything like that. Mm -hmm. And, and could I they tell? one of the reasons, yeah, all stimulation compared to DBS is extremely weak. Yeah, and uh, could, they, could they tell when the when the uh, when the model was working, or when you had it off as a control? Could they tell the difference just in attempting to do the task? 
No, uh, we, we didn't rigorously test that, right? For example, because we don't, in our design, we don't have a button like, uh, you know, let them choose whether you feel something or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because now we have, for example, when we do the simulation, we also have about 100, 200 cells, right? Like one third with simulation, one third with random simulation, and one third with model driven simulation. But we didn't add that function to ask them whether you feel anything this time or next time, right? So that kind of data has to be required for, uh, you know, uh, answer this kind of question. I'm, I'm extremely happy to see that you've started that work on the neuro foundry, that, uh, that foundry for making these new electrodes. That's actually wonderful. Um, and I'm very curious in the new, uh, micro stimulator that you've created, um, how precise can you be in time and in space? And what I mean by that is in space, in time, um, how soon after a stimulation can you record to tell what's going on without there being too much interference between the stimulation and the recording? Yeah. And in space, um, I know you're, you're stimulating generally a population of neurons and not a single neuron, but how, how large a population are we talking about here? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, great question. I, I have this kind of question all the time. Right. And I'm also really curious about it. So first question is relatively easier to answer uh, because the, 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 uh, uh, so the stimulation we are using is not really for, uh, you know, completely blocking all the artifacts, right? We are actually blanking the artifact, meaning when we stimulate, we don't recall, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we start to record right after stimulation, right? We short the circuit, right, to deplete the chart, and then we start to recall. And the reason is we don't want to saturate the amplifier, right? Ringing the amplifier so that the period of time we cannot recall. In typical system, that time period is tens or even over 100 milliseconds, mm -hmm. which is too long, right? Yeah. But using the blanking technique, we can reduce that delay to a few milliseconds. Oh, it's still not good. ideal, but to, you know, since new response usually is not that fast, right? To, you know, it takes the milliseconds for synapse to respond, for the population to respond. So for now, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something we can use, not ideal, but we can use. Uh, but obviously we are sacrificing the recording right, right during the stimulation, uh, which is not too long, right? A few needed seconds, right? Uh, but ideally we should be able to remove all the artifacts and uh, fully recover the signal, right? So for the spatial precision, that's something actually I don't know, you know, because I, I cannot record all the neurons, right, in that right population. But based on simulation and some other indirect evidence, I believe, right, as you said, that number is definitely not a single neuron, right? No. We try to stimulate the neuron we also record from. That we are sure we can do, right, because we can record from that neuron. But we, we don't know what we did to other neighboring neurons, right? Mm -hmm. But my guess is, it should be around several hundred, you know, uh, neurons. It's a pretty, it's not a single neuron, but it's not a huge population either, right? right. Because in the neighboring electrodes, some, in some of the electrodes, the density is pretty high, right? So can, we can monitor, you know, a different location within like a 50, 100 micron, right? And we'll get very different response, right? So it's definitely a single neuron, but it's also not the whole population as in DBF. Yeah. Okay. I, I know I have to have a gazillion more questions, but I'm seeing that people are probably already getting impatient to ask you something. So let me open it up to everyone right now. Anyone who would like to have a chat with Professor Dong Song, please raise your hand. Uh, Sarah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, that was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question about the brain stimulation and, and like these processes. And like, if anybody's actually looking at, we looked at simulating like multiple sites at once. And my thinking for this is like, I remember learning about how like gamma waves like ride alpha waves and that can help with encoding. And I'm just curious, like for example, you know, alpha waves, maybe they're coming from the thalamus and like the gamma waves are coming from elsewhere. Is anyone looking at like, you know, having maybe some like alpha pacemaker type 
stimulation, but compi- combined with these prostheses, or, yeah. or say prostheses, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And that's something we didn't consider in the beginning, but we start to consider like in the future, right? So uh, obviously a lot of information is encoded in those different frequencies, right? In the neural oscillation. At, at the very least, those oscillations can be used as a biomarker, right? For, for example, decoding the uh, memory state or cognitive state, right? Uh, but fundamentally, I still believe the majority of the information, right, is encoded in the spike activity, right? Yeah, that's really the neural code. Oscillation might be, you know, might be a code, but also I think more likely it's a byproduct of the coding, you know. Uh, it's 100% uh, correct that there's a lot of useful information encoded in those oscillations, right? So that's something we need to take advantage of. So it, it depends uh, on the I, oscillation yeah. you're talking about, right? I mean, there's a difference between, say, gamma oscillation, where you could say there's a very strong reason to believe that this is a byproduct of uh, neural mm-hmm. population activity, and uh, something like, say, alpha or theta or whatever you're talking about, those other large-scale uh, modulatory oscillations, which probably yeah. serve somewhat different purpose yeah. and yeah. may even, you know, kind of regulate how regions talk to one another in a sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think in future, I, what I really want to develop is some kind of hybrid, uh, you know, approach, combining, combining different uh, uh, signal right at the input, and also to stimulate the brain, uh, also with different, uh, different, uh, you know, like a different codes, right? Both temporal codes and also uh, frequency code, or uh, right. So. Yeah, I think that's that's a great question, and uh, this is something we we didn't try, but we do. Uh, we are planning to. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. I see here that Arseni would like to say something. He's unable to raise his hand, unfortunately, but he asked in chat if he could ask a question. Arseni, are you able to open your microphone? Does that work? Um, yep. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Song, uh, I'm interested a little bit more in details of what Kendall mentioned, uh, specifically the uh, self-report of the patients about how they feel or not feel the prosthesis working. Uh, is, uh, is the transition between on and off state of prosthesis uh, made uh, with a patient being uh, in conscience? Oh, is I, it, I did it here very well. Uh, can we repeat your question? Uh, uh, is uh, the transition between on and off states of the prosthesis made uh, while the patient is conscious? Or is it done under, I don't know, maybe for some reason under uh, anesthesia or something? No. Oh, those patients are, they are all awake patients. They are conscious, right? So they have okay. to remember those items and uh, get a correct response. So, uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I was interested in that moment of transition between on and off state. So no one reports like uh, noticing that. So what, what do you mean by the on off state? You mean on off of the consciousness or, or something else? Uh, on and off state of the prosthesis. Like when you turn it on, turn it off. Uh, also, and, and on the I, prosthesis, and, we, we turn it on, on and off, right? So, and, so uh, ideally, yeah. And it goes unnoticed by the patient. No, right? So, so no. In, in a permanent, we turn the prosthesis, right? so-called prosthesis. Now, it's not a really intangible prosthesis yet, but this whole system, we turn it okay. on after we present the image to the patient. Mm-hmm. And then we turn it off uh, like two seconds after the patient generates a sample response, right? So mm-hmm. the reason is that we believe that period of time is the, basically the encoding time. It's when the patient looking at the image to form that memory of the image. So that will mm-hmm. be the critical time for sending the stimulation. Although mm-hmm. if you think about the concept of this prosthesis, it doesn't require to turn on and off, right? Because I mean, in the brain, 
not really turned on and off during your behavior, right? It's always on. It's continuously receiving input, generating output. But for, yes. for practical reasons, we just simply couldn't continuously stimulate the patient. That'd be a lot of stimulation and it, our results will be much harder to interpret. So what we did, we did turn on and off around the, what we believe to be the critical memory formation uh, time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I see that Lisa has her hand up. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm super interested in knowledge representation. So I'm so excited by the results you showed, especially regarding the visual memory encoding. And um, I was super impressed with how well the different categories could be distinguished. Um, I remember you had sort of like animal building, plant, and tool. And if I understood correctly, you were using um, images at the stimuli. And I was wondering if you had also tried to um, try it with different inputs, such as text or audio. And if so, did you have similar results? Or if yeah, not for sure, for sure. Uh, we, we didn't try anything other than this. Because even with this simple task, real task, I don't think we had enough time for each patient, right? And we need to repeat it from multiple patients to get to, you know, uh, significance, right? Statistical significance results. So I would love to try different modality, right? For example, other research groups like the Michael Kahana group, the other group under DAPA RAM, they are basically using verbal kind of the memory task. They, after, they, they show different words, right, to the patient and ask the patient to remember as many words as possible. So that's a very different task. And they choose that task for obvious reasons. It's very easy, right? It's very simple. Uh, one of the most commonly used tasks uh, in, in patients, right? So we, we didn't include that, but I would love to. And in fact, my dream experiment won't be this very simple static image, right, uh, task. It should be something as close to episodic memory as possible, right? It should be something, something involving different modality. There also should be a temporal component, right? If you think about every thought in memory, it's not just visual. It can be visual, auditory, can be olfactory, and it also involves the sequence of events, right? So ideally, to fully test the capability of this kind of procedure, we need to design a task that includes a real episode in memory, include different modalities, include this temporal sequence. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to raise their hand before I ask another question? Okay, then I'll take my opportunity here. Um, I'm curious because we've talked a lot now about the application side of things and what it's like for patients. And we've talked about what it takes to make a uh, neuroprosthetic and the problem of making the right electrodes and the right kind of stimulation and post-processing and all this sort of thing. Um, in all of this, of course, there's a modeling component as well and a bunch of theory, some, some ideas about what a neural code really is in the hippocampus. And I understand that one thing, of course, that um, you and, and all of your collaborators have worked on trying to express is that you see the neural code as being um, spatiotemporal rather than just, say, a spatial pattern of uh, whatever's happening in one moment of, of, of activity. First of all, so let's say even one particular memory would be composed of a spatial temporal arrangement in sense. Um, and I'm wondering, since we last spoke about this and with your new insights, have you, first of all, have you learned anything new about those theories, about that insight and what you think may be going on there? And secondly, I was wondering if, um, in, since you now have uh, done a lot of work trying to develop new electrodes to use with this this approach and this, these assumptions, um, have you noticed any particular differences in working with patients versus working with animal models and the way that uh, the rodent brains respond? Okay, so, yeah, so in terms of spatial temporal pattern uh, or now your encoding in general, I think what we learned most from uh, uh, recently is from this memory decoding model. Uh, I haven't shown uh, shown you all the results yet, right? But mm -hmm. what we 
discovered, I think, from those human patients is that if I, if we identify those characteristics, right, of that decoding window, one important discovery is that we found those category, right, related information, they are very sparsely distributed in different neurons and at different time points, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is partially because the, the specific type of decoding model we are using, right? Because to avoid overfitting, we use a sparse model representation. So that almost, you know, force the model representation to be sparse, right? But nonetheless, when we look at the distribution of those regions of interest, right, for different categories in those spatial temporal patterns, we found they are highly distributed and highly sparse, right? It's not like a, uh, not something like a, what you see in, in, in place field, right? Here, it's a very sparse distributed code. So that, I think, is what we learned um, the most interesting from those human recordings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of animals, it's still in relatively early stage, right? Because we first, we want to validate, optim optimize those actual. We want to make sure we can record a lot of neurons, right, reliably for a very long time, a long period of time. We just recently moved on to uh, test those electrodes also under different behavioral tasks, right? So this is uh, in, in the future. Uh, in terms of the modeling, uh, yeah, as I said, it's still in relatively early stage. Now maybe now we focus on getting good recordings from animals, then we can move on, right, to uh, trained animal to perform those different memory tasks. <clears throat> and with the larger population of recording, mm -hmm. we can further right, refine our model. We can do a lot of things we couldn't do with the more limited data we had before. So, okay. Yeah. And in the human case, so I know that uh, we've talked at, at other times about um, how different parts of the hippocampus are involved with probably with different categories or different types of memories to some extent and that often these experiments are focusing on recording in just one particular part of the hippocampus so you're not getting the whole breadth of that yeah. um and uh that's one thing to pay attention to i guess but the other is also you know the the sort of base assumption when you go in there would be okay every brain is developing on its own and so everyone's creating their own set of uh connections between CA3 and CA1 and so forth so that you have a uh, mapping that is very unique to each patient. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering how unique that really is. So now that you've got the memory decoding model and you've been looking at multiple patients and you've been extracting something from that, have you been able to tell to some extent whether there is a similarity uh, in the way that these connections have developed or in, at least in the way that you're picking up your sparse, uh, sparse representations that you're working right. with? Yeah, yeah, we have an ongoing project. Uh, so, so, you know, I was asked this question many times in the past, right? And many times from you. <laughs> and we did some analysis uh, using, uh, you know, the data we have. Uh, sorry that my gardener is working outside. It's written for me. That's okay. Yeah, it's just a few seconds. <laughs> So, yeah, we, we did some the kind of the analysis, try to you know, answer this question, right? But now we started to start a new project, more formally working on this problem using a transfer learning approach. So the idea is that we try to build a model, right? Using the data from all patients, different sessions, you know, different, you know, different neurons, and even from different patients. Right. And we use this transfer learning framework to see what information can be shared, right? Can be transferred from one patient to another patient. Right. So I didn't have time to show the results yet, but what we discovered is that in rodents, we have a lot of data in rodents, right? Performing that delay non metro sample task. And we found in rodents, Transfer learning can play a very big role in terms of improving model performance, uh, you know, using data from multiple animals. Mm -hmm. 
right? The implication that from other animals' patterns, right? We can learn a lot of things about a new animal. Lots of information can be transferred, right? But we didn't see that in human data yet, at least not the, the data we recorded using the ad hack lecture during the delay metro sample task, right? I think one of the main reasons that in animals, we have multi array, right? We have eight arrays and with very precise location to the hippocampus in different regions, right? We have like, uh, oh, sorry, we have eight in the left hippocampus, the right in the, uh, eight in the right hippocampus with identical spacing between the, those electrodes and the same depth, right? So it's a, it's a tensor MEA and also the implanted location is more regular, more co better controlled, and the number of neurons is bigger. That's probably the reason we were able to transfer information across each animal. And the meaning is there are some similarity between the patterns. Although the similarity, um, it's really hard, hard to pinpoint, right? And now we use the embedding, it's a pretty deep embedding of those patterns, use the deep learning, right? So there is a certain lower dimensional space. They, they show the similarity, right? But how exactly they show similarity is still something we need to explore. But in the human patients, we didn't see that. We, we see very little benefit of combining data, right? Uh, yeah. to, to improve the performance. And I think the main reason is probably not because human hippocampus is fundamentally different from the rodent hippocampus. It's probably due to the very small number of electrodes we have in each patient. And every time the different orientation, different location of the implant electrode to, to the patients. It, it's not like a, as controlled as in animal study. So, yeah. but if later we can have a bigger coverage, right? Higher density uh, in, the, in the human hippocampal recording, I would love to try this, uh, this transfer learning approach again to see how much information is, uh, is redundant, right? It's, uh, uh, it's preserved, right, across different uh, human subjects. And that's, I think, is something essential, right? Essential for the success of the prosthesis. Right, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting sort of chicken and egg problem that you have here, which is that you need to have a well-functioning neuroprosthesis to eventually have a medical application so that it will be worn by people for a long period of time, which would then give you the data to understand more because you have yeah. a lot of recordings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that'd um, be good. Yeah. If we can form that positive feedback, right, we will learn more and more. Yeah. We will do the better prosthesis, right? So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, before I ask another question, which I always have so many going on, um, anybody else would like to ask a question or uh, have something clarified or whatever, raise your hand, please. Everyone's so quiet today. Then I'm just going to carry on since I'm on a roll. Um, I'm very curious about the application of the more detailed models that you've been making. So the, um, uh, the neuroceutical models that you have, the ones that are very, uh, trying to be rigorous about modeling uh, mechanistic aspects of detailed neuron models in say dentate gyrus CA1 and so forth, and how you apply what you've learned from that. I'm sorry, I've got a, an alarm going off here. Um, how you are applying what you're using these models for, how you're applying that to your efforts in developing the neuroprosthetic models. Yeah, so I'm sure there'll be a lot to be learned, right? By doing this combined model, but the main purpose here is really for understanding how the hippocampus, you know, form those memory functions. Or specifically in that project, they focus on the navigation function. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have so many theories, right, about uh, how information is uh, encoded and transformed, right, processed by the hippocampus, right? So with those knowledge, I would say like textbook knowledge, right? Biology, you know, basic neuroscience knowledge, right? Make me, make a lot of people, including myself, almost believe we already have the majority of the knowledge, right? To build a real hippocampus, right? But on the other hand, we also have so much recordings, right? Large, larger scale recordings from the, at least the rodent hippocampus 
during naturalistic behavior, right? So the, the goal of that part is really for combining those two to rigorously test whether our current knowledge about hippocampus is sufficient for generating or explaining the kind of the large scale recording dynamical responses we observe in the hippocampus, mm -hmm. right? So that's the reason. First, we based on the biological knowledge to build this, what I call the ultimate generative model in campus, right? Include every single neuron. It's a single neuron resolution, full scale model in campus, right? We build this model based on the, the best, to the best of our knowledge, right? And when necessary, we also cast data to, to further constrain this model. And if this model is correct, the type of the input output function, the type of the input output signal should be very similar, right? If not identical to what we actually observe from the real signal from the real hippocampus, right? Right. Yeah. And in order to do that, we need to have a develop a new machine learning tool, right? Because comparing brain signal from one model to another, like the real brain or between brains, is never trivial. Those neurons they don't have a one to one correspondence, right? It's not like neuron one in model one is neuron one in brain one, right? right? They don't match. So we have to use like a latent representation, right? Also use, use deep learning, right? We really need to identify the population level invariant representation of the brain function. That will allow us to do the comparison and also further the validation of the biological model with the, with the real biology. So, so that, that's the whole idea, right? Mm -hmm. So. In order to do this, we need to have better and better generative model, that biological related model. And also we need to have better and better discriminative model, which has the input of the model component, right? So in that sense, in the end, hopefully, I hope, right? In the end, we'll have a super realistic hippocampal model can be used for as a test bed for understanding hippocampal function. And on the other hand, we also have a super sensitive, super accurate, input of model that can, you know, uh, best differentiate real hippocampus from the, you know, simulated hippocampus, right? And mm -hmm. as a byproduct, that will be more accurate, more powerful input of model for developing the procedure. And which regions have you uh, modeled in great detail so far? So this one, we want to include all the brain regions, all the hippocampal regions uh, from dentigerous C3 and C1, right? Uh, okay. we, we won't explicitly model into renal particle or subaculum neurons. We will consider them as the input output to the whole hippocampus. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Excellent. I think we have maybe one or two minutes left. Uh, if there are any final questions. I see a couple of hands going up. Uh, Nicola. Hi, very nice talk. Thank you very much for uh, all the clarity that you brought on the hippocampus. Um, my question is kind of philosophical. Um, when you were speaking about the recordings and the detailed information that you have to get, um, and even with the very high resolution, multiple input, multiple output electrodes, you're very low resolution with respect to the number of cells that are in the hippocampus. Um, your recordings are bilateral. So is there one hippocampus that has a left side and a right side, or are there two hippocampi, a left hippocampus and a right hippocampus, and every representation has to be fully built in each one of them? So uh, we, we typically record from the two hippocampi in human, and definitely in all the rodents. Right. Uh, but, you know, all, all, all the uh, memory task is relatively simple. We, we didn't see like any difference between the two hippocampi, right? Although, I mean, there's a lot of studies showing the left and the right hippocampi, at least in human, they have a you know, slightly different function, not completely different, right? But there are some differences. Uh, so those, those details are not something we haven't considered yet. Because all experimental paradigm, the behavioral task is really, really simple, right? So, 
I don't know whether I answer your question or I understand your question correctly. Well, we, it can be taken in multiple angles, but for example, think about um, split brain patients and memories that they can form and whether you're recording from the left or from the right hand side, even that language is lateralized, showing the image might not matter, but telling them about the house then the representation that they will build will be in one of the hippocampi and mm -hmm. then later on transmitted in the other if they had the connection between left and right hemisphere. Yeah. So that, that has some implications about whether in the future where you would imagine those um, prosthetics playing a, a role more than just the, the, the exp scientific exploration of how hippocampi works, whether you'll have to implant on both sides or just mm -hmm. one side. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that I completely agree. You know, considering, you know, the super rich, right, function of the hippocampus and the you know, the information is uh, actually distributed in different hippocampal regions. So, so that kind of details I think should definitely be considered in the future applications. Yeah. That was probably a fantastic question to end this on, since we're now beginning to go over time. Um, we should probably let Professor Dong Song get back to his work and we'll all go about our, our own particular daily work as well. I'd like to thank everybody for joining. This was a fantastic update on your work. Uh, I'm really looking forward to learning more to see uh, what's going to happen with all these fantastic new electrodes because the technical hurdles have always been sort of the main things kind of standing in the way of getting, getting further along with the prosthetic work. So thank you very much. And yes, I see some people giving you a hand. That's a great idea. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at the next uh, keynote.